comes to fiction, I think that it's a different circumstance. Um, and yes, I, certainly we should be bringing in academics, we should be bringing in scientists to weigh the real arms of this, but um, I'm not sure that a blanket ban serves this kind of purpose. Hello, and thanks for joining us for this second episode of Prostasia Foundation's podcast podcast series, Sex, Human Rights, and CSA Prevention. Today, we're going to be talking with Gillian York about censorship. Censorship, not just in general, but censorship of some of the most controversial content on the internet, which is sexual art depicting children. Now, you'd think that nobody would stand up for such content, but you'd be wrong because the Lolicon and Shotokan community of anime fans have stood up to defend their art form, which does engage in some depiction of sexualized images of children. Now, many people find this content disgusting, but there's a good reason why we might want to hesitate before allowing a United Nations committee to decide that written works and drawings should be banned. <laughs> In the United States, child pornography is defined in federal law only to include representations of real children or representations that can't be distinguished from real children. Japan, the cultural home of Lolicon and Shotokan, is another country in which they recognize a distinction between real images of minors in the form of photos and videos and drawings or animations of fictional or imaginary minors. Now, it's this distinction that the Committee on the Rights of the Child wants to eliminate. Today, I'm talking with Gillian York, Director of International Freedom of Expression for the Electronic Frontier Foundation. Gillian, thanks for joining us today. Thank you for having me. So my first question to you is, what are the legitimate restrictions on freedom of expression that are allowed under international law? And how does that relate to child pornography or child sexual exploitation imagery? So international law provides for the restriction of the right to freedom of expression in only a few narrow circumstances. Um, That includes the rights or reputations of others, things like defamation, um, or the protection of national security, public order, or public health or morals. And these are things that are interpreted by governments. Um, When it comes to child sexual abuse, I mean, most governments have agreed that um, harms done to to children in real life should not be allowed to be depicted um, in expression. So the question, the big question, I guess, is whether that expression has to take the form of a a, a recording or picture, uh, like photo or video of a real child or whether it can be an imaginary or fictional child depicted in in drawings or even in written form. Um, So the Committee on the Rights of the Child has claimed that banning the depiction of fictional minors is justified as a restriction under um, international law because, and this is a quote, such depictions contribute to normalizing the sexualization of children and fuels the demand of this is not quite right the way they've said it, but fuels the demand of child sexual abuse material. Now, we can argue about whether or not that's true. And to some extent, that's a question for scientists and sociologists and and other experts to say, well, does it sexualize children? And if so, is that a harmful thing? Um, But let's assume that it is true. Um, If so, is that kind of indirect harm to children Um, sufficient to clear the bar of necessity and proportionality? I wouldn't think so. So when it comes to the images that we're used to talking about in this context, we're talking about situations where actual children have been present. And of course, it makes sense to protect children, real children from harm. Um, But when it comes to cartoons from fictional characters, things like that, um, I think that it's a bit of a stretch to suggest that um, these, you know, these characters need to be protected. I do feel that um, fictionalized images are should be considered very distinct from real images, and I think that when we talk about the things that need to be um, kept <laughs> in view, we should be looking at a more narrow definition of censorship, and that includes anything that really causes harm to an individual. Um, now, again, I'm not a scientist, uh, not a not a sociologist, or well, at least not um, 
an academic in that respect. But I do feel that this is something where we should be, you know, thinking a little bit harder about what the harms actually are and whether there are any actual benefits to uh, allowing these images to exist. Well, even if we're not talking about images, uh, in this um, case, the Committee on the Rights of the Child seems to be suggesting that even written works um, can be within the ambit of, of child pornography. And there have been some cases um, in the United States where purely written texts um, have been censored. In one case, there was a child sexual abuse survivor, a woman in her 50s, who published some fantasy stories online and was uh, charged uh, under US law it's with obscenity, um, which is a slightly different legal kettle of fish to child pornography. But what we're seeing here from the Committee on the Rights of the Child is they're trying to bring those two concepts together. And um, whereas we have a distinction between child pornography as defined in law, which harms children, and obscenity, which doesn't have to harm children, but can just have a general sort of moral uh, impact on society. Um, they're trying to conflate these two things. Um, what, are the, what are the benefits, do you think, of actually keeping those concepts separate? Huh. Well, it's funny that you bring up obscenity because it's such a broad statute that allows for the banning of really anything. Um, you know, you know it when you see it, right? And so obscenity has historically, of course, been used to ban all sorts of things from sex toys to to the content that you talk about. Um, I think that, you know, I do think that it's actually really important to keep these concepts separate. Again, I think that it's important to measure the real harm. And of course, when we're talking about children, the real harm occurs to actual human beings who are involved in a situation. That is not you know, up for debate. Um, but when it comes to fiction, I think that it's a different circumstance. Um, and yes, I, certainly we should be bringing in academics, we should be bringing in scientists to weigh the real arms of this, but um, I'm not sure that a blanket ban serves this kind of purpose. So there may be content that we don't want to be banned under international law, but which platforms may still not want to appear. So, I mean, it's, it's quite legitimate to say, as platforms like Reddit and Discord m m have said, you know, well, we just don't want images that make our users uncomfortable, and so we're going to make a policy decision to ban those. Um, but what kind of process should those platforms go through if they are impinging technically on freedom of expression um, and they have a user base that's going to be affected by policy changes in regards to sexual speech. What kind of process do you recommend they should go through? Sure. So platforms have already gone way too far when it comes to sexual speech. I mean, we saw Tumblr back in December, I think it was, um, ban all kinds of sexual speech. And it's, it's been fascinating. I've been doing interviews uh, around this for a couple months now. And I've talked to people who literally have told me that they, they like, I talked to a trans woman who said, I wouldn't have known I was trans if I hadn't have had the Tumblr community that I'd had. Or um, another person who said, like, that they, they discovered um, sort of a whole new world of queer art through Tumblr. Um, and so I think that, you know, those spaces, of course, companies have the right to censor whatever they want. We, we recognize this as law, um, whether we like it or not, right? But I think that we, that these companies need to be thinking about who their users are. Um, and I think that they need to be consulting, not just with, I mean, I know that they're, they're obviously consulting with child rights activists, they're consulting with um, hate speech, you know, anti-hate speech groups, but they're often not consulting as much as they should be with groups that are concerned with freedom of expression, um, and particularly with sexual expression. And we know this um, from everything that's happened in the past couple of years around SESTA and FOSTA, mm -hmm. around the increasing restrictions on various platforms um, when it comes to pornographic and sexual speech, um, sexual solicitation. And so, yeah, I mean, I think that First companies, I mean, I, I, you know you know that I could go on about this forever, but I, I will, I'll give a couple clear points for those folks who are listening. Um, I think that companies first need to consult with the right folks. They need to be, of course, yeah, you've got to talk with your subject area experts, but you also need to be consulting with free expression organizations to understand the implications of any types of content restrictions that you put into place. Um, companies need to be thinking about appeal systems, um, ensuring that, you know, when they do put restrictions in place that users have 
have a path of recourse. Um, and you can see this in the Santa Clara principles, which also build on the Manila principles, which I know you were involved in. Um, and uh, the other thing I would say is that, you know, companies need to be in better communication with their users, um, have more notice, uh, more procedures in place to let users know what exactly they did do wrong um, so that they can try to rectify the situation. That's great. So uh, for those who are watching this as a video, um, there'll be links to those documents that you mentioned um, uh, down below. And we'll also make sure that they're on the podcast page for those who are subscribed to this as a podcast. Um, now, you mentioned um, that Foster has been a, a big part of this crackdown on sexual speech, but I wonder what are your thoughts on uh, the extent to which it has been a direct result of Foster, or, or to what extent is it just part of a much bigger force of sexual conservatism and, and Foster is just a piece of that? You know, it's hard to say, um, and I and I'll I'll fully admit I'm not um, I'm not the expert on on U.S. legal issues, um, but you know I think that FOSTA has given good cover for a lot of companies to do the things that they already wanted to do. So it's you know it, it's really hard to tell in some of these situations whether it was the law that mandated some something or whether it was you know the company's decision. Yeah. But the the real detriment is even if FOSTA it gets overturned, these companies still have the ability to say, oh, well, you know what? We did that because we wanted to do that. Yeah. And so it will still have the effect of rolling back freedoms. Um, and I think that, you know, for not just for, I, I mean, yes, I, I think it's, it's easy to talk about things like topless, like free the nipple, um, topless women, um, things like that. But I think we should also be talking more about, um, you know, pornography. I mean, if we don't allow pornography on platforms, for example, we have what we're seeing on with porn online is this sort of um, conglomeration of these these few major companies that are all producing the same very masculinized porn, um, and all of the the like smaller producers are having a hard time getting their stuff seen. I've talked to Erica Lust, for example. I've, I interviewed her a couple of months ago, um, and that's something that's a challenge for her and her company. Yeah. Um, and then on the other hand, you know, you also have sex workers who have relied on these platforms, um, and and sometimes they're not, tr you know, they're they're not actually because of, of course, yes, some forms of sex work are illegal in some jurisdictions, respect the law, um, but in some cases, sex wor sex workers can't even conduct legal transactions on platforms because of the nature of their work. Yeah. Um, so, for example, you have. Um, uh, people who act in porn films who you know you you like do a patreon to raise money for some reason um, and then they can't have their patreon or their GoFundMe stay up because they're giving away um, you know DVDs of of their porn um, things like that and I think that this is this is all stuff that has to get talked about yeah well well one thing that we're doing as Prostasia Foundation is we're going to be bringing together the internet platforms uh, and the payment processes and some other um, people in this space to a meeting in May um, along with sex worker representatives and some of those other people who are excluded um, just have a roundtable discussion to talk about well um, how can we prevent child sexual abuse and, and um, child sex trafficking uh, while still allowing sexual speech online because um, the, the, we, we were actually talking a, a little earlier that you were starting to feel a little uncomfortable talking about this area because it is such an uncomfortable area when we're talking about child sexual abuse. It is. Um, and, and it's natural for people not to want to talk about it. And unfortunately, what happens when that's the case is that nobody will stand up when measures like this one that are being discussed in the United Nations are, are going through because no one wants to say, well, actually, I think people should have the right to post cartoons of naked children. Nobody wants to say that. I mean, uh, now, the, pro the problem is the impacts of such a ban aren't going to just be on the people that you don't like. It's not going to just be, you know, pedophiles who are going to be impacted by that sort of uh, restriction. Um, some of the research that I did before this call into... so. The fan community, the anime fan community, the hentai fans have, have come up in arms against the effect of this on Lolicon and Shotokan. Lolicon are the uh, cartoon images of, of girls, Shotokan are the cartoon images of boys. One thing that I assumed was that, well, maybe there is 
you know, a pretty shady community around around these types of art. And I found that that's absolutely not the case. Like I spoke to uh, some uh, people who um, are Shotokan fans who are predominantly women. Uh, women are often drawing this this cartoon art as well. And, and it has a surprising amount of depth to it. Like it's not just mm. for jerking off to, you know, this is actually, um, it's actually a, an art form that's got a history to it. Um, so I spoke to uh, to a, a Lolicon artist, and, and he was also explaining, look, th there is artistry to this. There is, um, you know, uh, there is a community of people, most of whom have, have zero attraction to real children. Um, but yet this, this art form is, is one of the ways that they express themselves in a way that isn't really culturally um, sanctioned. Um, but... Uh, but but when we when we hear oh well child pornography all of that nuance gets shuts down and and suddenly um, you know entire communities that have built up around a certain art form are uh, lumped in together with those who are actually uh, sharing videos and pictures of children being sexually abused I think it's important for us to sorry this has turned into my interview um <laughs> but, but i think it's important for us to to keep that distinction very clear isn't it yeah no absolutely and i i think that you know I mean, we've seen that sort of we've seen those lines get blurred in a lot of different ways i was just thinking back while you were talking um was thinking back to 2008 you probably remember this being australian um the the clean feed uh the no clean feed I mean, yeah. So that was one of the very first things that I ever worked on in this space. Um, and I was—I remember like being in touch with some journalists there. And 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 the goal of that. Um, uh, so back in like for, again for the listeners, uh, 2007 I think it was Australia announced a filtering scheme um, to block nearly 10,000 sites. Uh, a young person cracked the filter, um, leaked the block list. Um, ISPs were told to keep quiet. And then basically, like the the filtering scheme was intended to um, block illegal material. Um, but one of the things that I remember about it was that there was a sexual health site for youth that got caught up in the filter. And that's the thing that happens, right? Like I, I think about Scarletine, some of these, um, yeah. you know, youth sites that I, I mean, I I was a huge fan of Scarletine. I was the exact demographic teen in the '90s. Um, and I think that, you know, kids should be able to access sexual health information online. Absolutely. Especially if they're not getting it from their parents or in school. Um, it's vital. Uh, should they be able to get porn? That's a different question. But when it comes to sexual health information, it's absolutely vital. And unfortunately, drawing those lines is really difficult. Um, and the thing is that most kids are going to find a way to get around these filters and get to you porn but they're not necessarily going to find a way around the filter to get to the sites that provide the right kind of information for them. Um, and I think that that's another concern about filtering is that, yeah, of course, people always know the, the brand names, right? Everybody knows to get to Facebook, but not everyone knows to get to that little site. Yeah. Uh, well, to this week, actually, Prostasia Foundation filed uh, its uh, brief in the Foster litigation. And one of the points that we made in that um, was there are platforms that we've speaking to, spoken to. Uh, unfortunately, I can't name them because these were private discussions. Um, but they said that um, Foster was a factor in them censoring uh, blogs about child sexual abuse prevention um, because some of these blogs were written by people who were sexually attracted to children and they were talking about how they overcome that attraction and prevent themselves mm. from uh, breaking the law and from hurting a child. Um, so uh, you're, you're right that sometimes the impact of this um, censorship uh, does include sexual health information, it does include child sexual abuse prevention information, it's not just dirty pictures. Um, yeah. So if you are an individual who has something like that taken down, whether it's a blog or maybe it's a drawing, um, and you think that a wrong decision has been made, what should you do? What's, what can you do to get that uh, decision reviewed? Oh, unfortunately, right now, um, a lot of platforms don't provide a lot of options. We're hoping that they're going to get better on this. So um, I can, we'll throw up a link here, right? Yeah. Um, so yeah. EFF Who Has Your Back report, uh, 2018's report um, shows that, I'm, I'm actually pulling it up as we speak, 
um, shows that quite a few companies do offer appeals systems, um, but we're pushing them a little bit harder for 2019. I can't give you any details yet, um, but uh, suffice it to say, I think people will be pleased with what we've done. Um, yeah, so we're, we're trying to push companies to offer better systems of appeals, systems of recourse for users to be able to um, to complain to companies when a decision has been made that um, that is wrong. Um, and sometimes the decision is wrong against the policies, and sometimes it is, you know, within the scope of the policies, but is wrong, you know, in terms of freedom of expression or morality. Um, and that's another question. That's something that we're actually grappling with at the moment as well. I'm sure you're part of some of these conversations too. Actually, I know you are. We're on a call together. Um, but so, you know, one of the conversations that's happening right now out there in the ether is around um, the concept of companies having some sort of external review board. And I think that this is something that the public should actually be getting involved in and pushing for. Uh, it's really important because it's a way that the public might be able to have a say in how companies um, develop policy. And yeah, of course, some of this may not go in our favor. Mm. Um, you know, I know that there's going to be some, some strong pushes against hate speech, but um, I hope that at the same time, there will also be some strong pushes in favor of um, an increased amount of speech around uh, sexual content. Excellent. Well, I mean, it seems that these discussions are taking place in, in a couple of different uh, places inside corporate boardrooms and then um, at the United Nations. Um, can you say, maybe finally, something about the link between what happens at a governmental level and what does happen at a, a corporate level? Are these discussions linked and, and how? So the UN isn't going to be making a, a new treaty um, exactly. It's just going to be a, an implementation guideline for an existing treaty. Um, mm. So it's not directly going to have the force of law. But can you see a, a path for that to impact the decisions that companies are making? Um, yeah, I mean, I, so this is also a little bit outside of my expertise, as I think you know. But at the same time, I mean, really what it comes down to for me is that companies are influenced by um, decisions that are made at these bodies, right? And so whether it's a decision made by U.S. Congress, a decision made by um, the parliament in the U.K., um, other countries that these companies have, you know, lots of <laughs> resources in and listen to, um, you know, a UN decision, an EU parliament decision will have similar repercussions, I think, uh, over what sorts of measures these companies take. And they, they needn't be binding. I mean, if we look at, um, for example, the, the actions around terrorism, um, we've seen a lot of, uh, I'm trying to think of, not the, not the German one, but the, the European one, the European Commission's rule on terrorism, I yes. cannot recall what it is called. Um, but anyway, yes, yeah, so for the public, again, um, there is a rule that basically companies have agreed to voluntarily um, that they will take down offending terrorist content, terrorist promoting content within 24 hours. Um, and that is, you know, quite a difficult task, quite a big endeavor for them to take on. Um, but uh, that's something where it's it's a non-binding agreement, and yet you know these companies are all on board, and I can see that sort of thing happening in this case as well, um, regardless of of whether it's binding or not. So uh, we've just about run out of time, and I appreciate all the time you've taken out of your day for this call. But uh, can we leave our listeners with any resources that you think they should be uh, looking at, or any people they should be following um, to find out more about this issue of sexual censorship? Yeah, so um, so I'll give an obvious shout to EFF where I work. Um, I'd also like to give a shout to um, my friends at What's the Safe Word. Uh, I interviewed them a, a little while back, AMP specifically. Um, they're a, a kinky YouTube channel that has been repeatedly censored in various ways on the platform, um, and they're fighting back against that. Um, they believe in you know education for everyone, positive sex positive health education. Um, and yeah, I mean, I think that there are a lot of great organizations doing work around this. Um, it would be hard to name them all, <laughs> um, but yeah, I think uh, I'll try to I'll try to give some shouts out from EFF so that you can just follow us there. <laughs> That's great. Well, thank you very much, Gillian, for talking with us today. Yeah, thank you for having me. Thanks for watching. What I know has been a difficult discussion. It's hard to stand up for freedom of expression when it's couched in the language of child protection. But this latest proposal at the United Nations would not protect children. What it would do is to chill sexual speech in harmful ways. 
So we're asking you to stand up and tell the United Nations that art is not child sexual abuse material. You can add your signature to a petition to the Committee on the Rights of the Child by visiting our website, clicking Campaigns at the top of the page and clicking Tell the UN at the bottom. After that, please subscribe to this podcast. If you're watching on YouTube, you can do that by clicking our logo right here. Thanks again for watching and we'll see you next time on Sex, Human Rights and CSA Prevention.